Hey everybody, uh, welcome back to part two of our video series on uh, sawmill blade tension. Uh, I'm out here at the sawmill today. It's a nice day, no rain. And so we're gonna set up an attempt to measure the uh, tensile stress in the uh, bandsaw blade on my Woodland Mills HM122. Um, so let me get the camera flipped around. We'll look at some theory on paper to talk about what we're gonna try and set up and measure. And then we'll go ahead and uh, make those measurements and see what we get. Okay, so in our last video, we talked about how putting a torque into the uh, tensioning mechanism on a woodland mill sawmill uh, induces a force on the follower wheel that puts tension loads on the blade and ultimately uh, tensile stress in the blade material. And today we're going to try and uh, measure that tensile stress. Um, there's a couple ways you can do this. Uh, there's actually a uh, bandsaw blade tension meter you can buy. Lennox sells it. Uh, it's around $350. Uh, that makes it real easy to measure the tensile stress in your blade and, and know how to set and tension your blades. But um, I, I kind of had a little bit of heartburn about spending $350 on a tool that I uh, probably only use once for this video. And uh, so I wanted to do make this measurement a different way. Um, really a little bit more basic way. But what we're going to do is we're going to take advantage of the fact that um, in a material, in the elastic range of a material, and by elastic I mean uh, before you bend it or deform it or break it. So in the elastic range of a material, if you pull on it, it's going to really go back to its uh, starting shape. Okay. Um, in that elastic range, uh, stress is proportional to strain. Strain is just a measure of the elongation of the material, the relative elongation of a material. So if you know its original length and you put a load on it and then you measure its stretched length, uh, that can tell you the strain. And through this relationship where stress is proportional to strain, the constant of proportionality shown here with the big E is Young's modulus. And for the material in our, our bandsaw blades, it's uh, known to be about 29 million PSI. And so if we can measure this strain or the elongation, we have Young's modulus here, we can then calculate the uh, tensile stress uh, in the blade uh, fairly accurately uh, through this relationship that elastic materials follow. Now the way I want to do this is kind of shown up here and there's, uh, there's uh, many ways you could actually do this, but if you think about your two wheels and your blade uh, band stretched between them here in red. If we come down to the um, bottom section of the blade, really where the sawmill would be doing cutting, what I want to do is take a bar, clamp it to the blade on one end, set up a dial indicator, and this could be a dial indicator, it could be a set of uh, calipers, there's a couple ways you could do this, uh, that bridges between that little uh, beam piece there and um, a block that's going to also be clamped to the blade over on this end. If I can measure the distance between those two uh, before I load up the the band and then tension it up, load it up, and uh, this dial indicator is going to give me the change in that distance very accurately because uh, this is going to be, you know, thousandths of an inch uh, uh, of a change. So we need something accurate to, to measure that and a dial indicator is good at that. Once we get that change in length compared to the original length, we can come down and make this calculation here. So that's uh, really the basic theory. And here's the setup uh, that I came up with. What I've done is I've flipped my, uh, I flipped the, the blade guide out of the way on, on this end and I actually took that one off altogether just to give me more room to work. And I've got a um, small piece of aluminum uh, C-channel and this, this bar, this little beam, it could be made out of anything. Even a nice straight piece of wood would work, but I had this scrap piece of aluminum around. It's lightweight. I figured, hey, what the heck, I'll use that. So you can see it's clamped to the blade down over here. And then down on this end of that C-channel, I've got a dial indicator mounted and uh, I've I've screwed it, uh, I've kind of shimmed it in there with some pieces of wood and then screwed it down so it's tight in that channel. And uh, then over on this end, I have a, just a little angle bracket. This is also clamped to the blade down in this end. 
and the dial indicator is just you know pushing up against that what i did was when i clamped this bracket down i preloaded the dial indicator by compressing it a little bit by about a i don't know three three eighths of an inch or so um and so with this setup um when we start stretching the blade this dial indicator is going to stretch out because that distance is going to increase and we'll be able to measure that um, pretty accurately now i've done a few uh, tests with this to judge how repeatable it is how consistent it is how accurate it is um, and i found it to be surprisingly good it's i'm getting the same um readings every time uh, you know i was going to try and take a whole bunch of readings just in case i needed to average them to get rid of any noise in the, the measurement but it's it's been consistent within uh, a half of a thousandth believe it or not uh, which is good to see there's one i think major caveat here and that is where you start reading your stress because you know these bands they come in a box this is a by the way this this blade has been used uh two or three hours already um so it's not new by any means but uh, when i took it off to 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 uh flip the guides out of the way uh you know this this band wanted to spring back to a big oval shape that's just the way they're made you know they come in a coil um they're shipped in a box uh, it wants to spring back to a more of an oval shape. And so um, if I come over here and I just push on this blade, you know, you'll see that dial indicator moves, right? And I had a hard time determining what my zero was going to be before we really start stretching this blade because um, it doesn't want to lay flat here until you really start putting just a teeny little bit of tension on it. Uh, before you tension it when it's slack, it wants to dip down and up top here it wants to go that way it's trying to get back to its big oval shape so what i ended up doing is um, i put a ruler from the sawmill down to the blade and i slowly increased my tension and i kept looking at this blade and i saw it rising up rising up straightening out and then it pretty much stopped it wasn't straightening out anymore and that's the point where I considered us to be at a zero, where we've taken any of the sag um, and any of the, uh, you know, shape, oval shape tendency out of the blade. Uh, but before we start really inducing a lot of the tension uh, by the tensioner jig. And that, to me, that's the biggest flaw in this method. Where, what you call your zero point, what, where you say, I'm now starting to stretch and tension this blade. Um, and you, you really want that to be just past the point where you've taken out any of the sag, any of the shape memory of that blade, but before you really start stretching it. So I played with that a little bit. Um, and I, you know, I, I looked at that, doing that a couple different ways. They were all within five thousandths of each other in terms of what I was getting for a zero on this gauge. Um, but I decided that the method with the ruler looking for that blade to stabilize its shape and be straight and level down here, I decided that was the best way to establish my uh, zero point and uh, call, call that my starting point to, to measure the, the tensile stress um, in that blade. So what I'm going to do now is um, set up the camera so you get a better view of that dial indicator and we're going to crank this up and uh, make a measurement, see what we get. Okay, so we got the camera set up looking at that dial indicator. What I'm gonna do now is uh, set my torque wrench to 20 foot pounds, which was really the, the lower uh, end of the adjustment range recommended by Woodland Mills. And I'll crank on the tensioner handle until the torque wrench clicks. And um, then we'll come over here and read and, and see what we get. Okay, so it clicked off, and what do we read in here? Uh, that looks like 85.5. Uh, 
um, uh, the dial indicator. And this one actually, you know, we started at zero. This one actually, because we're stretching out, we're taking out some of the displacement from the dial indicator. This is actually going to run backwards. And so we went from zero to 85.5, and that works out to be 14.5 uh, thousandths of elongation or stretch that we've uh, put into this uh, band blade by tensioning it up. So I'm going to go ahead and um, repeat this a couple times, make sure I get a consistent reading. Then I'll try my torque wrench at 25 foot-pounds, get some readings from that. And then finally, I'll go to the method I've been using for a long time, just setting the uh, thrust uh, bushing to be flush on the, uh, the uh, tensioning handle uh, and see what that does. I'll keep uh, track of all these numbers we get, and then we'll come back and look at them, do some math, and um, see what we're measuring for tensile stress in the blade. All right, so here we are back with our results. <clears throat> and um, right over here on the left, I listed the different methods I used. First, uh, setting torque at 20 foot-pounds, and then 25 foot-pounds. Setting the thrust bushing flush. Trying to go two and a half turns from slack, and then three turns from slack. And these are all methods we've discussed in the uh, previous video. Over here is the um, <clears throat> change in length uh, I measured in each of those cases in thousandths of an inch and it you know ranged from uh, the lowest was uh, 11 thousandths for the two and a half turns method the highest was 19 thousandths for the 25 foot pound torque method uh, but these other guys uh, fall fall in between um, and I put some stars here to mention something kind of interesting and I didn't want to forget it uh, I, I mentioned in the previous video for the last 10 or 11 months I've been simply setting the thrust uh, bushing flush on the uh, tensioner handle on my mill and everything's worked great for me. Well, that uh, results in uh, 15 thousandths um, uh, elongation in the uh, uh, blade under tension. Well, uh, visually if I look at that bushing, it looks flush also up here at the 20 foot-pound torque setting and that's 14 and a half. Uh, thousandths elongation, and also the three turns method, which was uh, uh, 16 thousandths elongation. So, you know, it's interesting to see, at least for my mill, uh, the flush method um, lines up almost perfectly with uh, the 20 foot pound uh, torque setting, uh, but also very close to three turns from slack on the handle. And so that was kind of good to see. Um, it gives me kind of a good confirmation that what I've been doing all these months is certainly in the ballpark. Uh, today is the first time I've actually used a torque wrench on my tensioner. I know some people do it every time. I've been strictly using this method, um, but it's good to see that it lines up pretty close between the 20 and the 25 torque setting and um, very close to the three turns method. So based on these changes in length, um, went over and used this formula. And by the way, I measured the starting length between the clamps at uh, 20 and three quarters uh, inches. And so when I, I, I run through the formula here, uh, these are the stress levels that we're uh, measuring, uh, tensile stress levels we're measuring in the in the blade and the band. Um, they range from a low of 15,373 for two and a half turns, a high of uh, 26,554 psi for the 25 foot-pound uh, torque method. For my flush method, it's just um, right under 21,000 uh, PSI. Uh, for the 20 foot-pound method, it's just over 20,000 PSI. And then uh, for this three turns method, it's just over 22,000 PSI. So there's a lot of consistency there, there between those methods. Um, and it's interesting if we compare that back to this table we used in the previous video where we were calculating this based on different torque inputs and different assumed values for the uh, uh, efficiency of the jack screw and the tensioner based on friction losses and things like that. You know, I think I mentioned, well, this, this these numbers are probably too high. We can throw away this bottom row. Um, but our numbers here, you know, um, we're in the, the 15 to basically 22,000 range. There's kind of a high outlier at the 25 foot pound setting. We're squarely within the uh, the top row of this table, and uh, 
this first guy here and just kind of approaching up here. So, you know, this is good confirmation of, of the theory that we went through. Um, we're getting actual measurements, you know, that fall into this uh, same range. And so I think that's great to see uh, that type of agreement. Um, it's, it's always nice to see when, you know, some theory and experiment can converge to give you confidence and some sort of an answer, um, even if it's an estimate. You can use two methods and drive towards uh, similar numbers. That's great confirmation. That's the way to build confidence in uh, your methodology. So, so that's good to see here. Okay, so I thought it would be good to do a, a, a recap of what we've talked about over these two videos uh, where we went into uh, uh, blade tension on sawmills. So we started out by talking about how a torque input on the tensioner handle uh, really translates into a force on the follower wheel. Uh, we then converted that to uh, a force uh, in the blade, blade tension force. And we went through some numbers and calculated that. And you know, ultimately we got that down to the stress in the blade, which is really just a function of the tension force we're generating in that blade, in that band, uh, over the cross-sectional area of the blade. Uh, this is where the calculations can diverge. Uh, I think, as far as I know, all the woodland mills, uh, sawmills right now are using a 1.25 by 42 thousandths uh, blade. They're all different lengths for the different models, but they're using that, uh, same cross section. So if you're using that uh, that stock blade size on the mills, uh, then the stress calculations are going to be relevant no matter what mill model you're you're running. If you've happened to change to a different size blade, um, then you'll need to uh, you know uh, adjust the, the stress calculations accordingly. It really shouldn't be too hard. You just got to scale things based on the size of your blade. But you know our ultimate goal was to calculate the tensile stress in the blade band based on typical types of tensioning settings that we use for the mill, whether it's a torque wrench at 20 to 25 foot pounds, um, or uh, you know the flush bushing method or the, the two and a half to three turns method. Um, you know, the ultimate goal here was figure out what the stress is in these blades and, uh, and work that out. We did that, uh, you know, first with theory, we came up with a pretty good matrix of, of, of numbers uh, for, for blade stress that were generally going to be somewhere in the 15 to maybe 24,000 PSI range based on our estimates. And we had to make an assumption about the efficiency of that, uh, that jack screw uh, based on the, the friction losses in there. Um, but in general, you know, we we're expecting somewhere between 15 and 24,000 uh, PSI tensile stress in the blade. And so uh, then we came out here to the mill and uh, we, we set up this this measurement right here that worked extremely well. I'm, I'm really impressed with this uh, uh, this rig. Um, after reviewing the numbers uh, one more time, I, I feel like you know we got accuracy probably within about five to six percent, um, which is pretty good. And again, the biggest source of uncertainty, in my opinion, was where I started measuring that stress. And I think that the trick to that is, you know, gently tension up that blade until it, uh, the slack is gone and you can see it straighten out and stop straightening out. And to me, that's the point where you're going from uh, overcoming that shape memory of the blade to actually putting tension on it. So that's where I set the zero and that's where I started uh, uh, measuring the uh, elongation of, of the blade or uh, of the band and so we came up with with the numbers for that uh, and they showed very good agreement for our theoretical prediction based on really simple mechanical engineering theory really just basic basic mechanics uh, so that was good to see I think the, the fact that you can um, estimate something on paper and you know, when we did our estimates, we assumed different possible values for the efficiency of the jack screw and different torque inputs, but that gave us a nice boxed in range of values. And uh, sure enough, when we came through and made the measurements, we were right smack in that range. Um, and, and I'm real happy with those results. Uh, that's always really nice to see. Um, 
And I think the takeaway for me is that for all these months, I've been setting the thrust bushing flush on the, the tension handle, and that's obviously been working great. Uh, I mean, you know, like I said earlier in the video, I've, I've never thrown a blade. I've always had really nice uh, results, very good performance, nice clean cuts. Um, I couldn't be happier with the mill, the way it's been performing at that eyeball tension setting uh, of, of flush with the thrust washer. Um, well, it turns out that agrees uh, really well with the 20 foot pound torque value. It agrees really well with uh, three turns uh, from slack on the tensioner handle. And these are the, the methods Woodland Mills has recommended in that recent uh, tech bulletin that they put out. So, uh, you know, it's good to come back and go through this exercise and, and kind of validate that, yeah, it's been working great for me. And it's probably because I'm in that range where they want things to uh, be set for, for attention. Um, so I think that's going to wrap up our video. Um, I guess if you have any questions or comments, please leave them below and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll I read everything. Um, I'm also real curious about what people think of these types of videos where we, um, go into the theory and talk about some engineering. You know, as I mentioned at the beginning of the first video, most of my stuff that I posted on YouTube is really based on practical know-how, uh, just real basic stuff, uh, which to me is super important, both when you're using a sawmill and when you're doing other sorts of forestry operations or just general country living. I mean, experience and practical know-how is, is super important. Um, but in this case, I felt like it was good to mix in some theory, some actual engineering, uh, based on my background as a mechanic, mechanical engineer. And again, I've got multiple degrees in, in mechanical engineering. I've taught mechanical engineering and mathematics at the university level. I've got 30 years experience out in industry in R and D. So I felt like this was a good opportunity to bring some of that into these videos. So now I'm curious, you know, what do you think of that? Is that worth doing more of? Um, so anyways, I guess that's it for today. Um, as always, thanks for watching.